Hello everyone, I'm Simon Brisman and with me is Nick Shah. We're going to talk to you today about the Digital Operational Resilience Act. Um, we're specifically aiming this webinar at suppliers because our supplier clients are meeting a greater wave of requests from their customers in the financial services sectors to make changes because Dora is coming. And over the course of 2024, those uh, requests are going to come in increasing numbers as banks get ready for their compliance deadline of 17th of January 2025. So do listen and we'll explain what the phenomena is, why it's happening and what supplier clients of ours are doing about it. Thanks, Simon. And thanks everyone for joining. So what are we proposing to cover in today's webinar? Well, Simon's going to kick us off with a brief overview of what DORA actually is and the context in which it's arisen. DORA itself may be relatively new, but the landscape in which it's sitting is not. DORA is the latest in a line of operational resilience initiatives in the financial services sector and part of a wider global trend towards regulatory oversight of critical infrastructure. He'll then move on to look at who's affected under DORA. And a bit of a spoiler alert, in addition to financial services entities who are, of course, the primary focus of the regulation and in relation to whom the majority of the obligations apply, IT suppliers in the sector will also be impacted, either indirectly or directly. The next stop is going to be to examine some of the heightened requirements introduced under DORA. Now, DORA not only brings within scope a much larger number of financial entities than was the case under previous regimes, but also expands the scope of the things that those entities are required to do to be compliant. Many of these are technical and operational, and some of them are legal and contractual. One of the key requirements under DORA, certainly from a legal perspective, is the requirement for financial services entities to manage their third party ICT risk. And I'll take a look at what that means in practice and some of the key changes that's going to bring about. One of the key aspects under that regime is the requirement for financial services entities to ensure that their contracts in place with suppliers contain certain key protections. I'll spend some time examining these requirements and considering how the obligation can best be met. For IT suppliers, the priority here is going to be to minimise the concessions made whilst preserving competitive advantage. And we'll look at how this is being done in practice. By this stage, it will hopefully be apparent to you all why this is relevant to IT suppliers into the financial services sector. But if not, then Simon's going to look to drill this home at this point. And we'll round off our exploration of the regulation by looking at the regime affecting certain critical ICT third party providers and how those suppliers will be directly regulated for the first time. One of the biggest unknowns facing suppliers into the sector at this stage is who's going to be determined critical. And Simon's going to look briefly at the regulator's guidance on this topic. Finally, we'll suggest some of the next steps, which hopefully will provide you with a useful framework to beginning or continuing on your DORA compliance journey. And with that, Simon, over to you to set the scene for DORA. Great. So let's uh, start by understanding what DORA is. Uh, more technically, it's not an act. The Digital Operational Resilience Act is actually an EU regulation. So it's uh, European level uh, law, which binds the whole of the financial sector within the European Union. It's not a UK law, although the UK is having a think about its own response. Uh, the regulation is there in response to a number of things which are happening. Uh, one is the broader background that there are a number of global initiatives in the financial services sector covering banking, covering insurance and covering trading in shares, uh, which have all converged on deciding that technology is so ubiquitous uh, to banks and other financial institutions that there needs to be a degree of regulation in how banks use it. And the second is a dash for operational resilience across all of those areas, operational resilience in the general sense, being about whether a regulated firm could suffer an event without seriously affecting its customers or causing an impact on the financial services system. Digital operational resilience is specifically looking at how um, information technology systems and the processes around them impact on the operational resilience of financial services firms. So what we have here is a European approach to making much more stringent the amount of regulation around the technology that a wide range of financial services firms use, uh, 
and asking for natural services firms to bring up their suppliers to the same standard if they may impact on that financial services firm's ability to operate. Uh, the law will apply from the 17th of January 2025, but financial firms have got their governance in place and are generally thinking about these issues now, which means the first of them are starting to reach out to suppliers to ask for those changes to be made. Due diligence is beginning and contract negotiation will follow shortly. So it applies from 17th of January 2025, but the time to act is now. I've uh, hinted that this is about financial services firms. It will cover the vast majority of financial services firms operating in Europe. There's some exceptions, for example, for very small firms and in some uh, areas, but many, many more people are affected than previous generations of regulation around outsourcing. Um, the obligations apply directly to financial firms themselves who, of course, are regulated already, and this is additional regulation they will have to adopt, adapt to. However, for the first time, we see critical uh, service providers um, regulated directly, and they may be the likes of, for example, AWS. We'll come back to who we think that list is later. And other ICT third-party service providers, that is to say most information technology providers, are impacted since the financial services firms will have to bring those service providers up to standard. So those IT suppliers, the great majority of IT suppliers, are going to be subject to new and strict requirements which uh, impact on how they run their systems, the degree of security they have, the amount of testing they do, and the contractual obligations they're going to have to have in relation to all those issues with their uh, financial services clients. Thanks, Simon. Now, as Simon alluded to there, ICT third party providers are defined very, very broadly indeed as any undertakings providing ICT services, which comprise digital and data services provided through ICT systems. When the regulation was first published, there was, I think it's fair to say, some market scepticism that the definition could truly be interpreted that broadly. But to banish any doubt, the European supervisory authorities who are responsible for enforcing LORA published a report on the 27th of September 2023 containing their initial overview of the ICT third party provider landscape. And what was shocking in that is that they identified over 15,000 suppliers who they believe would fall within that definition. When they looked at first line subcontractors, the number increased to around 20,000. So that's a very, very significant number. And I think the key message there for suppliers is I don't think that this doesn't apply to you just because you're providing a type of service that you consider might be incidental to the operation of the sector. So that's who DORA impact. But what does DORA actually require? Well, we won't spend too long on this slide because, as we previously mentioned, a number of these obligations are imposed directly on the financial firms themselves rather than their suppliers. But we would ask that you always keep in the back of the back of your mind this question as we go through. In order to achieve these obligations, what, if anything, will the financial firms require from their suppliers? And what does that mean with how they're going to contract with and engage with you as a supplier? DORA requires financial firms to put in place enhanced business continuity and disaster recovery plans and processes and to report to regulators on the testing of those. It also requires firms to bolster their incident management response and reporting frameworks and introduces new requirements around those, in particular around incident reporting to regulators. Now, as many IT suppliers, of course, found in the context of GDPR and the reporting timelines under that, that often translates directly into a consequent monitoring, reporting and remediation obligation on suppliers under the contract. Firms are also required to conduct regular penetration testing of their IT environments to implement robust backup procedures, to undertake frequent vulnerability analysis, to monitor technological developments, and so on and so forth. Now, even from that brief canter through, you probably get a sense of how much the financial firms are being asked to do, and in turn, what that might mean for their suppliers, who at a minimum are going to be required to input and assist with that work. It's worth mentioning here one aspect that I think is often overlooked, and certainly it's been overlooked when we've had a number of conversations with suppliers, which is the importance of governance within the organisation 
a lot of regulatory change isn't going to be driven purely by putting in place new policies and practices. There needs to be enhanced governance in place. That's a requirement of the regulation for financial entities, but it's an essential part of the work stream for suppliers to make sure that they're standing up teams and there's alignment within organisations to ensure that these requirements can be flowed through adequately. And we'll come on to talk a little bit about this later on in the slide. Now, before we look on, before we move on to look at the primary obligation which will impact IT suppliers, which is the obligation on financial entities to manage their third party ICT risk, I just wanted to flag briefly a very recent development in this space. <clears throat> DORA itself is a regulation, but under the regulation, it's left to the European supervisory authorities to provide firms with more prescriptive details of their obligations via a combination of secondary legislation and what are called regulatory technical standards. In the absence of those, many firms we've been talking to had been struggling to define exactly what it was that they needed to do under DORA, and therefore, as a consequence, what they required from their suppliers. The good news, from a clarity perspective certainly, is that on the 17th of January 2024, the regulators delivered the first batch of their regulatory technical standards. Those comprised four reports covering topics such as approaches to harmonising ICT risk management, the criteria for classification of IT incidents, templates for the register of information that needs to be provided to the regulators, and content on the policy in relation to contracting for services supporting critical or important functions. Now, it's fair to say without going into too much detail that these regulatory technical standards are incredibly detailed. For example, the policy on harmonizing ICT risk management extends to 182 pages and contains invaluable detail for financial firms and also by implication their suppliers on exactly the steps they need to take in order to meet the obligations around DORA. And it's an essential first step for organizations in their compliance program to review these alongside the text of the regulation and to identify the gaps between the requirements under the regulation and the standards and existing practice. I just want to draw out a couple of interesting points. So in developing their guidance on these frameworks, the regulators have considered existing European and international standards on ICT risk management including the EBA guidelines, EOPA guidelines, NIS2 directive and NIST, but also the ISO standards and other international standards. And I think one point it's really worth making is that for a lot of organizations, particularly sophisticated IT suppliers, a lot of the work required to comply with DOOR will be building on existing frameworks you may already have in place. For example, those required to comply with things like ISO and SOC2. The guidance under the standards is technology neutral and importantly doesn't mandate use of specific products or technologies. And the final critical point to make is that proportionality is built into the guidance by design. So firms are encouraged to consider the size of their organization, their risk profile, but also who they're contracting with when producing risk management plans and frameworks. Okay, so, Moving on then to look at that obligation around management of third party ICT risk. Now, of course, management of ICT third party risk is a topic that's been the subject of a great deal of regulatory scrutiny in recent years in the context of broader operational resilience initiatives in both the EU and the UK. Regulations such as the EU's NIS directive and more recently the NIS2 directive, and in the UK, the UK Network and Information Systems Regulations have very much shone the light on importance of containing ICT risk in upholding the stability of the economy at large. There's a very clear consensus forming amongst regulators that resilience can only be achieved where every link in the supply chain is brought up to a minimum standard of cyber security, where industry sectors are increasingly reliant on ICT services for the conduct of their operations, it's no surprise that the spotlight is being shone on IT providers. Now, DORA builds upon this and requires financial firms to take a number of active steps to manage their third party ICT risk, including to implement an ICT third party risk strategy, which needs to be regularly updated, implemented and reported on to the regulators. Firms are required as part of that to develop policies on the use of ICT services provided by suppliers. And those policies are included 
uh, intended to include protections regarding, for example, the substitutability of the service, the approaches to supervision of the service, and other such topics. Firms also need to regularly and on an ongoing basis review the risks that they identify in respect of any contracts supporting critical or important functions within their organisations. And we'll come on a little later to look at what that means in the context of Dora. They'll also need to maintain a register of information covering all contracts with third parties, and they'll need to report on these arrangements to the regulators. And again, you can see very quickly how whilst these are obligations imposed on the financial firms themselves, they'll all require some level of input and cooperation from their IT suppliers and will certainly frame the way that these financial firms engage with their suppliers. And you might start to expect to see some of these obligations flow down into your contractual terms or other governance forums in your engagement with your financial services customers. Now, we've highlighted here three aspects of the regime which will very clearly translate into requirements on the IT suppliers. The first of these is the requirement for firms to conduct enhanced pre-contract diligence prior to selecting their suppliers. The second are requirements relating to access, inspection and audit rights covering third party providers. And the third are requirements to ensure that contracts entered into with third parties contain certain minimum protections. And we'll look at these uh, briefly now. So looking at the first of those requirements in slightly more detail, the requirement for firms to conduct enhanced due diligence prior to entering into arrangements for the use of IT services. Firms will be required to consider various matters as part of their selection criteria, including assessing all relevant risks, including the possibility that contracts might lead to non-substitutable provision of service, or having in place multiple contractual arrangements with the third party's service provider. They'll need to weigh up the costs and benefits of alternative solutions. Where contracts include the possibility of subcontracting services, they'll need to weigh up the costs and benefits and risks that may arise in connection with subcontracting, in particular where subcontracting is overseas. Where a contract provides for subcontracting, they'll also need to assess whether and how potentially long or complex change of subcontracting may impact their ability to fully monitor the contracted functions. And they'll need to assess compliance by the ICT third party service providers with appropriate information security standards. And where the contract concerns the outsourcing of critical or important functions, the standard is lifted up and firms need to take due consideration of the use by the third party provider of the most up to date and highest quality information security standards. Now, all of these matters, amongst others, will need to be captured by uh, the firm in their policy on contracting with third party providers. And the regulatory technical standards, which I mentioned earlier, specify the contents of that policy in considerably more detail. Separately, firms are going to be required to ensure that their contracts with third party IT providers grant them broad information access and audit rights. And interestingly, firms are required to, on the basis of a risk based approach, predetermine the frequency of audits and inspections over their third party providers and the areas to be audited. And the common theme we'll keep coming back to is that we might expect firms to be conservative in this area, to require rights that are perhaps above and beyond those strictly mandated by the regulation. DORA pre-bakes in certain termination rights that need to be included in all contracts with IT suppliers. And where the IT services support critical and important functions, firms are additionally required to put in place exit strategies. Now, again, the regulatory technical standards cover off some of these provisions in considerably more detail. And it will be interesting in due course to see how firms capture these requirements in their policies. One area where DORA is very prescriptive and certainly uh, reflects a uh, see change against previous regulation is in specifying the minimum contractual protections that need to be included in contracts with third party providers. Now we put up on the slide there some of the provisions that need to be included in contracts with any third party provider, including comprehensive service descriptions, SLAs, provisions of data security, business continuity, financial monitoring, restrictions on subcontracting and service locations. Importantly, DORA differentiates between 
both standard ICT third party providers and contracts for services which support critical or important functions. The latter category also need to include enhanced rights, for example, requirements to participate in threat led penetration testing, rights to monitor supplier performance, exit strategies and establishment of transition assistance, and active monitoring of performance. Which all, of course, begs the question, well, what is a critical or important function under DORA? Unhelpfully for IT suppliers, DORA more or less leaves it to the financial firms to determine which of the services they receive support critical or important functions. Article 2 of DORA does include a definition, which is that a critical or important function means a function the disruption of which would materially impair the financial performance of a financial entity, or the soundness or continuity of its services and activities, or the discontinued defective or failed performance of that function would materially impair the continuing compliance of the entity with the conditions and obligations of its authorizations. But ultimately, it's going to be the financial entities who need to assess whether the relevant thresholds have been satisfied. And this, of course, presents a very real risk that firms will adopt a conservative approach in making their determinations and may default to applying the higher standards prescribed under DORA to their broad swathe of their supplier base. Unhelpfully, this approach would be supported by some guidance issued by the regulators. In their report on the landscape of third party providers, the regulators identified that of the 15,000 or so IT suppliers active in the sector, around 9,000 supported critical or important functions. Now that's a very significant proportion of the whole number. And to illustrate this, the regulators included in the table that I've extracted in this slide. What this shows in brief is that a very high proportion of each given type of service or pool of identified contracts is considered critical. And the percentage is consistently high across all types of service albeit that there are some categories of service where criticality almost seems to be the default. So for example, things like network infrastructure services and data center services. For suppliers then, it may be sensible to adopt a somewhat cautious approach at the outset, especially if you're providing one of those services where criticality seems to be the default. Some, if not many of your customers may consider you to be critical even where you don't think you are. And importantly, the regulators may back them up. So uh, listening to Nick there, you've had a lot of detail in the last 10 or 15 minutes. And just to bring this together, um, why is this all relevant to IT suppliers? You will probably have realised by now that DORA is broad enough to cover a very wide range of technologies and that uh, financial firms are going to need to come to their suppliers uh, on enhanced due diligence and on uplifting terms and conditions. And in some cases, we'll be asking more in relation to audio penetration testing and so on, which may lead IT suppliers to uh, conclude that they need to uplift their own compliance in order to meet the requirements of their customers. So there's a lot going on there. And this is exactly the area where we're beginning to help clients uh, regularly in understanding that process and understanding the extent to which Dora bites on them and what they should do about it. Uh, it's relevant to you if you want to retain financial services sector clients because they are affected, they have little choice. And while you will want to understand if they're being a little bit too robust in the standards they try to impose or not, ultimately IT suppliers are going to need a plan for helping their customers to comply. Um, the pre-contract due diligence you can expect, you're going to need to be ready to respond to more questions. It's quite likely you have standard responses on a number of issues, but the range is going to expand. Uh, the issues are going to go into are going to get deeper. In some cases, you may have policy, for example, uh, not revealing information about penetration testing, where you're going to have to examine the extent of your policies. Firms are going to look to renegotiate their existing contracts. Uh, if you are a managed service or outsourcing provider, you may well have an MSA on the bank's terms, which you'll be seeking to uplift. But even if you're a SaaS provider who tends to contract on your own terms, if you didn't have a financial services annex already, you're sure to need one now. 
And finally, some IT suppliers are actually going to be regulated to a higher degree than that. They're going to be directly regulated by DORA. It won't just be a matter of firms imposing on them. And they will be, uh, they will be classified as critical ICT third party suppliers. And uh, we'll get on to explaining what that means. So critical ICT service providers are going to be designated directly by the three European supervisory authorities who broadly oversee banking, insurance and trading in securities. Um, we're going to find out exactly who they are, probably around July 2024. But for the moment, we have a good idea of how they're going to be chosen based on DORA and some of the guidance we've already seen. A critical ICT service provider is likely to be one whose failure would lead to a systemic impact on the financial services system, or perhaps because of the level of reliance of that uh, supplier and the lack of substitutability would be difficult to replace. There are a range of other factors, but you'll see the point that some ICT third party service providers, some suppliers are so intrinsically part of the system that their failure could cause a serious impact on the financial services system. Um, once they are designated as critical ICT third party service providers, DORA creates an oversight framework for them, which regulates them directly. One of the ESAs will be appointed as a lead overseer to assess and supervise them. The lead overseer will have broad powers. It is sure to seek information and documentation to understand how the critical supplier can support compliance of financial services firms. It is able to conduct investigations and inspections if it has concerns. And it may also issue recommendations to suppliers about what they need to do to meet the standards required. Now, they are maybe recommendations, but you have to remember who's making them. If you ignore the recommendations, the potential sanctions include penalties of up to 1% of average daily global turnover of the entire organisation. The financial penalties, therefore, could be pretty large. But in, in addition to that, there's the potential for regulators to actually suspend financial services firms who it regulates from using the technology. There's the ability to publicly disclose failures. So the sanctions are far more than just the financial penalties and could impact on the ability of a critical provider to operate in its markets and on its reputation as a whole. As a result, we expect that that list of critical ICT third party service providers are going to have to take their obligations pretty seriously, but it does create something of a double edged sword. On the one hand, their compliance burden is going to go up significantly. But on the other hand, they get something of an endorsement from the ESAs that they have a high level of compliance, which is going to help financial services firms to choose them and help them in their markets. Thanks, Simon. And just one final point to note is that the stringency of this regime is likely to mean that critical ICT third party service providers are themselves much more circumspect about the contracts into which they enter. Those contracts, of course, may be up or down the supply chain which means that if you're an IT supplier who's providing customers to financial entities, but whose services are themselves supported by other critical ICT third party service providers, you may find that you're being squeezed from both directions and will need to take that into account in your compliance exercise. So that was a bit of a whistle stop tour through what Dora says and does. But what should you as an IT supplier into the financial services sector do next and when? Well, the first point I'd make is the key one. Whilst implementation period for DORA may seem lengthy, the steps organisations will need to take to comply from day one are likely to be considerable and will consume a significant amount of management time and operational resource to effect. As such, it's important that organisations impacted by DORA are taking steps now to make the necessary changes. As we move ever closer to January 2025, Firms which delay planning and implementing change may find it difficult to meet the deadlines. Even if you don't want to engage with this until later this year, inevitably some, if not many of your customers will be, which is likely to force some level of activity. So in short, there's no time like the present 
Now, the good news, as I mentioned earlier, for a lot of suppliers is that a lot of this work will build upon existing frameworks and practices already in play within your organizations. As I alluded to, DORA builds upon a large corpus of operational resilience initiatives and also builds upon international standards in this space, things like ISO 27001 and SOC 2. So the first exercise is for organizations to take a step back and to think about what they currently have in place and how that maps against the requirements under the regulation. It's important when doing this mapping exercise, not just to look at the text of the regulation, but also to look at the text of the regulatory technical standards. And one thing we would strongly recommend our clients do is to consider not just DORA in isolation, but also other regulations that might impact them in the near future where providing services into other sectors. So things like the European Union's NIS2 directive and forthcoming data act, as well as other resilience uh, acts and regulations like the AI Act. Once you've mapped the requirements of the regulation against your existing practices, you'll be in a better position to understand the impact of the regulation and to start taking steps <clears throat> to alter your own systems and processes. One of the things you might need to do is to prepare some contract financial terms which meet the requirements of DORA. Now, as we said earlier, the obligation primarily sits with the financial entity to make sure that its contracts with IT suppliers contain necessary terms. But in order to get ahead of the curve and to propose terms which meet your requirements rather than your customers' requirements, it's potentially beneficial to be proactive and offer up terms to your customers before you're forced to react to their terms. An important point to note here is that DORA, whilst it's relatively prescriptive, does leave financial entities and their suppliers with some room to negotiate terms and protections around the edges of the core contractual requirements. For example, whilst contracts going forward will need to contain audit provisions, there's nothing to say that suppliers can't look to pass on the costs of those audits, for example, to their suppliers. Given the room for manoeuvre, we'd expect there to be something of an arms race between firms and their suppliers to see who can table their terms first. And as in any race, being the first to set off is a great help. Other things you might want to start thinking about doing now are how you might demonstrate enhanced information security to gain a competitive edge in procurement. As Simon alluded to earlier, there are probably two ways of looking at DORA either as a set of stringent obligations that are going to hinder your business activities, or potentially as providing you with something of a kite mark to offer you competitive advantage in procurements. We're recommending our clients start thinking about how they might want to demonstrate DORA compliance to gain competitive advantage in their procurement processes and putting in place packages that support this to their clients, which leads nicely on to how we can help. Now, we would, of course, love to work with you on your DORA compliance program. And this slide sets out some of the many ways in which we can help, but they're by no means exhaustive. And it's fair to say that as the regime develops, we're finding ever more angles to approach this from. We can help organizations with their mapping exercise and their gap analysis. And indeed, we've been helping a number of our supply, supplier clients get to understand exactly what it is that DORA and the regulatory technical standards uh, impose on IT suppliers as opposed to financial entities. We can offer a monitoring service that will help you stay on top of the various updates to the regulation, as and when those are published. We can, of course, assist you with identifying your key customer contracts and reviewing those proactively to spot gaps. And if necessary, we can do that on a low cost, high volume basis through our alternative legal service provider, Condor. For those organizations that tend to operate off their terms, we can help prepare financial services addenda for use with the majority of your customer contracts. And of course, we can tailor those to your standard terms. As I mentioned earlier, there's often value in thinking about these things holistically across regulations, and we can ensure that those terms reflect similar requirements under other regimes such as NIS2 and UK NIS. Where contracts warranted, we can deploy our deep experience to help you get the best terms from your key customers.
including in relation to things like audit, termination and liability. And we can offer bespoke training to operational teams, legal and management to ensure that everyone in your organisation understands exactly what it is that needs to be done. Now, at the top of this presentation, I mentioned governance, and it's becoming increasingly relevant across all operational resilience um, regimes and regulations that organisations have in place robust governance to support all of these compliance activities. One thing we can absolutely help clients with is setting up governance structures and advising on what good looks like from a governance perspective. Now, I think on that note, that's probably enough from us. We've covered a lot of ground today, and we hope you found it useful. But of course, if there's anything else you'd like to hear about, or if there's any way we can help you, please do reach out and we'd be more than happy to schedule a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Thank you very much.